good evening and welcome to a match of the day program which includes action from the top two divisions. Championship challengers Arsenal and Ipswich confront each other at Highbury. We go to Boundary Park Oldham for their game against fellow promotion challengers Sheffield Wednesday and we see the seven goals from Scotland which virtually decides the Premier League Championship. Tonight's headlines, Liverpool retain the League Cup after beating Spurs 3-1 in extra time. Ronnie Whelan is the hero, scoring twice on his Wembley debut, A Spurs lose for the first time in nine visits to the famous old stadium. Buoyant Bob Paisley was cracking jokes like Jimmy Tarbuck after the game. The Liverpool manager said the Milk Cup is another first for the club. The milk was turning sour before we equalised, but the two extra goals put the cream on it. Well, that's not the first nor the last of those milk jokes, I'm afraid, that we're going to hear. But milk or not, we start our action with a match from the second division. Although we've not been unaware of Oldham's prowess in that division, it's our first visit to Boundary Park this season. And quite an occasion, too, because their visitors were Sheffield Wednesday, whose away form has been exhilarating. Your commentator was John Motson. The spinning town of Oldham last saw first division football in 1923 but they're aiming for promotion this season despite a rocky run of only one win in their last seven games. Jimmy Frizzell, who celebrates 12 years as manager here this month, has taken number five Neil Firm on loan from Leeds this week because Kenny Clements has had a cartilage operation. He's also without Darren McDonough, who's suspended, but better news concerns number eight Paul Heaton, who joins up tomorrow with the England under-21 party for the match in Poland on Wednesday. Sheffield Wednesday have won eight away matches this season. They're unchanged. Mark Smith has been playing in midfield lately, and the top scorer is number nine, Gary Bannister, with 16 goals. Sheffield Wednesday manager Jack Charlton with the natty cap. Left the field in tears here last year, Jack Charlton, when he went to appeal to the crowd after an invasion of the pitch, and the game was held up for half an hour. Oldham in the blue shirts and white shorts playing down an appreciable slope from left to right. Sheffield Wednesday wearing yellow shirts today. Heaton for Oldham. In the way, Williamson. Roger Wilde of Oldham playing against his old club. He's wearing number seven. This is Hooligan, though. Steele making a target in the centre. Heading it on, a chance perhaps for Palmer. Well blocked by Gary Mexon. And Pickering for Sheffield Wednesday. Roger Palmer, the former Manchester City forward, nearly capitalising there. That was Heaton, and then Williamson, and now Hooligan. Firm. That struck Bannister. And McCulloch was in well. And Bannister running on here. McCulloch in the centre. Being joined now by Curran. And that was Curran. And this is Mexon. And it trickled away. Sterling's tackle on Ryan. Ball fast and furious. Here's Taylor. And offside, Terry Curran. Mel Sterling, who made that tackle on John Ryan, appears to have got the worst of it. It was a crunching tackle there between two fullbacks. Sterling really went in strongly. It was a fair tackle, it might be said, but uh, it left both players in pain. Twenty-two years this May, Jimmy Frizzell has spent with Oldham Athletic Football Club as player, coach and manager. Up goes Steele. It was firm away from McCulloch. Here's Bannister, and Terry Curran hugging the right wing for the moment, taking on a fullback who's still suffering from a knock, John Ryan, but uh, able to cope with that situation all right. That was Shirtliff. 
And this is Curran. Away from Ryan. And a foul by Fucher. And the referee says indirect free kick. Curran wants a penalty and won't get it. Well, there's a debatable one. Curran went past Ryan all right. He tried to go by Fucher. He was clearly fouled. But the referee awarding the indirect free kick inside the area. Which Curran takes and away by Fern. Here's Taylor. Williamson. Obviously, the referee saw that more as obstruction. Frank Roberts, who raised the arm in that fashion. Heaton. was on by McCulloch, what a good flick. And Bannister, but no, already offside. Offside against Bannister after McCulloch had flicked the ball on beautifully. One of the old-fashioned type of centre forwards, Andy McCulloch, so good at the flick on like that. But Bannister was offside. Here's Curran. Taylor. And now it's Smith and Bannister. Oh, he's onside here, it's Curran. Good stop by McDonald. Here's McCulloch. Megson is coming up on the right. And Curran again. And twice Terry Curran foiled by the goalkeeper. The best chance and the best save, certainly the first one. It was a one against one, and Peter McDonald, once Ray Clements understudy with Liverpool, made a good save. Here's Sterland. McCulloch going in, away by Firm. Williamson. Again, McCulloch is the target. Now it's Smith. And it was Smith again, he got one full in the face there as he challenged Palmer. Mark Smith went up for the header and Roger Palmer caught him. And I think Palmer's going to be cautioned for that. And it was a fierce impact, and it left Mark Smith stunned. Palmer has been booked. So play resumes with the free kick to Sheffield Wednesday. This is Sterland. Curran. Steele back in defence for Oldham. This is Atkinson. And Oldham is the home side, finding it quite difficult to get into the opposing half. But they have now. Roger Wilde. Nice turn. Keaton. Palmer. A bit careful now, Roger Palmer. Steel with Pickering. Hooligan.
that's McCulloch, here's Bannister, Curran's making a good run through the inside left position, forcing Firm to put it out. And the balance of play very much with Sheffield Wednesday here. Williamson. It's going to come out to Taylor. What a drive and a good stop again. Kevin Taylor hit it well. Peter McDonnell reacted well. Going to come back to Bannister. Firm with the header out. Nicely done by Ryan for Oldham. And now Keegan. Back by Pickering. Sheffield Wednesday always bring with them a fair band of travelling supporters. They've been backing the club through thick and thin and hoping to see them get back to the first division where they feel they belong. Heaton. Keegan for Oldham. Back again to Heaton. That was nicely done. Wild. And Heaton. And Steele coming in from the far side. And Wild with a chance. And Boulder didn't give him very much to shoot at. But Paul Heaton twice involved in the move. And Oldham's best move it was so far, without a doubt. Some really good play there in the build-up. Wild in the end with the shot. Away by Pickering. And Mel Sterland, who got the worst of an early challenge, and then, in fact, made another very good saving tackle on the edge of the penalty area later, has had to go off injured. And so Sheffield Wednesday forced to use their substitute. 18 years old John Pearson comes on after 32 minutes. He's a forward and been picked for the England youth squad just recently. Went over Pickering's head, Steele, Palmer, Heaton. Oh, he was trying to find Jack Keegan and he's given it away. Gary Megson for Sheffield Wednesday on the break. They've got four others forward here. One of them is Bannister, Pearson's in the middle, so too is McCulloch and there are three others in support. McCulloch hit the bar, Pearson! And the substitute scores within a couple of minutes of coming on. Megson began the move. Bannister went down the left. The cross came in. McCulloch hit the bar and Pearson had a simple job from the rebound. Sheffield Wednesday deserved their lead on the balance of play. They've got players forward whenever they can and they've earned their reward. It was in by Hooligan, the wind might have helped a little bit. Keegan, and a chance for Wilde, and Boulder came well. This is Hooligan. Flick on maybe for Palmer, here's Keegan! Well, this has been, at times, a sparkling first half in terms of attacking play. Oldham now having their say, Bob Boulder coming well to meet Roger Wilde. The second time the ex-Sheffield Wednesday player has been foiled by Boulder in an Oldham attack. And then in the end, it was Jed Keegan whose shot flew away from the target. And the referee blows for the end of a half in which Sheffield Wednesday's fans have seen them play exceedingly well, getting plenty of men forward 
using their front players to good effect. And 18-year-old John Pearson coming on as a substitute when Sterling was injured, scored the only goal of the half. Having to reorganise the formation, didn't seem to worry Jack Charlton's team, and they start the second half, playing now from the left with Shirtliff still at right back. And Pearson obviously up front with McCulloch and Curran. Mark Smith switched from the midfield into the back four when the change was made, which was where he was playing when he was capped by England under-21s. Put up and a free kick to Wednesday. And away by Firm as far as Atkinson. Then Keegan. Oldham need to discover some flow to their attacking play, which was missing for the most part of the first half. Another stop start. Here's Fuchsia. That's Fuchsia's shot. Oh, what a good save by Bob Boulder. Good to see a back four player come through like that and chance his arm. But it was the arm of Boulder that denied him. And the Wednesday keeper now has made three important saves. Here comes Fern. Oh, he scored. But no, the flag is up on the near side. And I suspect the linesman saw a player in an offside position and has notified the referee who wipes out the goal. So Neil Firm, who thought he'd scored on his first appearance, finds he hasn't. Here's Keegan, and now Heaton, and now Wild, and here comes Atkinson. What a good start to the second half here by Oldham. Two fine shots. One effort in the net, disallowed, as they get their game together at last. And Oldham also want to make a substitution because John Ryan, struggling with an injury from early in the match, has given it a try and is going off. But the substitute, handily enough for Oldham, is a fullback, Steve Edwards. running on, Fuchsia knocking it back. Kevin Taylor working well in midfield for Wednesday, and so is Megson. McCulloch running on here, so is Pearson, and it's going to fall for McCulloch. Good save. He was onside, and Peter McDonnell, along with having foiled McCulloch, along with his opposite number, Bob Boulder, making this very much an afternoon for goalkeepers. Free kick to Oldham, although Wednesday must be thinking it should have been 2-0 then, because McCulloch had a good chance, and McDonnell foiled him. Edwards joins the attack. In for Roger Wilde. That's his cross. Nice touch back by Andy McCulloch, who uh, had gone all the way back there to help out the Sheffield Wednesday defence. Epitomises the way they play today. On 
by current election. And away by Fuchsia. coming in there and it's come to Taylor deflection oh Pearson again no offside so a goal disallowed at the other end and significant that young Pearson was on the spot again as it was not back in but offside Played Heeson. Keegan had gone further in. Here's Hooligan. Heaton. And away by Pickering, but only as far as Hooligan wants more. He's found Edwards. Oh, and a shot at the far post and wide. Paul Heaton can't believe it. He should have scored and he knows. But the touch on the ball, taking it out for the corner. And he's arriving again now. Is uh, Heaton. This is Edwards. Bob Boulder really has kept goal well. But Steele is in here. Having a good afternoon is Boulder. And now Taylor, and a good run through... Oh, offside. I was going to say a good run by Curran, which it was, but Bannister in the picture there was offside. He was further forward. There's Palmer. Here's Atkinson. Here's Keegan. Steele trying to turn. Edwards. Palmer. Atkinson. And now McCulloch on the break against Firm. Terry Curran has just made the run on. And Curran puts it over. That's the danger of the counter thrust when. You're pushing forward as Oldemar to get caught by the away team on the break. McCulloch sensed where Curran was running, but he scooped it rather. On by Wilde. Played by Taylor. Future coming through though. Curran. And there goes Megson. Round the back nicely off. And Butcher coming across, put it out. and he buried it so three points beckoning now for Sheffield Wednesday in this important promotion match Steele is in the middle and away by Curran
Edwards. Atkinson's drive. There's been some good blocking in that Sheffield Wednesday defence, no mistake. Keegan is onside, and Oldham have got plenty of support in the middle. Enough said. The header was by Bannister, the man through is McCulloch. Out by Edwards, from almost on the line. Taylor now for Sheffield Wednesday, and McCulloch's in more space now. Here's Megson. McCulloch. Pearson. match looks like ending on a high note for Sheffield Wednesday their fans are the ones responding for the moment they have a two goal lead and a free kick here and it could so easily have been three a moment ago McCulloch at the post Bannister Taylor took the free kick McCullough got the flick in, and Bannister volleyed that emphatically past the goalkeeper who got his hand to it, but was beaten by the power of the shot. The Wednesday fans chant easy, and you can't help but draw comparisons with the match at Luton early in the season when Wednesday won 3-0 and looked promotion prospects. They've looked exactly that today. Bannister, who scored on that occasion, just one of many Sheffield Wednesday players as Keegan tries to get one back for Oldham and Palmer shoots just wide and as it was the final whistle goes three goals and three points for a very impressive Sheffield Wednesday team Gary makes an outstanding Bannister got the third goal to seal it exciting goalkeeping at both ends Bob Boulder and Peter McDonnell but on the day, the quality of Sheffield Wednesday's play was much in evidence. And Oldham, though disappointed to have a goal disallowed, were nevertheless, in the end, a well-beaten side. It was a hectic match, but a highly enjoyable one, ending with a score of Oldham nil, Sheffield Wednesday 3. Well, I, for one, am not grumbling about the entertainment value of that game. And I can quite see the Oldham players, fans, and manager Jimmy Frizzell being disappointed with the result because the contest was so much closer than the score suggests, as Jackie Charlton agreed when he spoke to John Motson afterwards. I felt sorry for Jimmy because, you know, his team's played very well today. We've played very well. 3-0, you look at it tonight or tomorrow morning, you think, we must have got run to death. And he didn't. You didn't. Now, and your keeper made two very good saves. Our oh, goalkeeper made two tremendous saves. And he came and plucked out corner kicks, and we, we had a, a spell where we had a lot of luck in there, where the three or four balls had hit our players and went outside the post, could have gone inside the post. And that would have been the equaliser. The fact that we won 3 nothing, I'm delighted for our lads, because they battled and they played well. And, and, uh... But I'm not an out-and-out -out attacking man. You know, when you've got something, keep it. And do it in the right way, and I didn't think we did it for that period, but we got away with it, and we won 3-0, and we're delighted. So how do you see the promotion race now? Well, if you can keep coming and bringing these people with you, because <laughs> every time you come this season, we've won 3-0, keep coming, and uh, you never know. We've got to start winning at home. If, if, it was, if we had had anything like a home record, we would be out of this division now, and we could have all gone to Spain on holiday. But uh, we're home performances have not matched what away performances. So it's... Uh, We've got to start winning at home. If we can do that, we'll get points away from home and we'll go up.
Well, for our second match, we go to Highbury, where Arsenal, playing Ipswich, are in the strange position of being championship challengers, but still currently out of favour with some of their supporters. They can win matches, but surplus goals seem to elude them. Commentator Barry Davis sought the views of some Arsenal fans about this problem just before the kick-off. I just hope Tony will decide to get a striker before it's too late. I mean, we need a striker. We've got to score goals, and we haven't got anyone to score any. I think the football's dreadful. I remember 20 years ago they scored nearly 100 goals. Now it's 22. It's a disgrace for a football of this, a club of this magnitude. I think it's disappointing that we haven't replaced people like Stapleton and Brady, but overall the fact that the club have managed to remain in the top six and around that area without blowing people, I think shows that uh, uh, Arsenal are still the finest club in London. They haven't been able to replace those principal players which left before, and I don't think they give enough opportunity to the youngsters. They rely too much on a fixed pattern and do not play the game as it should have been played 20 years ago, when we relied on wingers to bring the ball down to the byline and score from there. And it's still a great team. All we're lacking is somebody to put the chances away. It can't be a bad team if they make all the chances that they do. So all they need really is some, a striker, a good striker. Amid their problems, Arsenal introduced another new face to the Highbury faithful this afternoon. He's 18-year-old Paul Gorman, who comes from Dublin and who made his debut at Main Road, Manchester, last week. And he joins in the Arsenal team three other players who made the breakthrough this season. At number six, Chris White. At number ten, Stuart Robson, who started as a fullback but who is now playing in midfield and the substitute, Raphael Mead. As the side still looking for goals, their total in the league here at Highbury this season amounts to only 10. They're unchanged, and so are Ipswich Town, having gone back to winning ways against Everton last Saturday. But now joining friends Tyson, Terry Butcher, and Paul Mariner on the injured list is now the goalkeeper, Paul Cooper. So Laurie Civil gets another opportunity. There's quite a wind blowing, and it's blowing from left to right. And it's Ipswich wearing white shirts, who are playing into that wind in the first half. Here's George Burley. First header for the Arsenal skipper, David O'Leary. Graham Ricks, these days playing well forward. Paul Davis making the run. And the goal kick. And the referee this afternoon is Tom Bune of Cranley in Surrey. Here's the handball, but not given. Here's Sensum. Davis. Ricks. senior career.
Robson's team are to win the title. This is the sort of fixture that they have to win. Sunderland. And Muren's header. Again, the back there somewhat indecisive, but handball by Stuart Robson. Gates and White struggling. Brazil forced wide by Hollins. And Brazil denied by John Hollins, who forced him away on his left foot and forced him to the point where he couldn't pull the ball back. Good play by an experienced player. some distance ahead of Torbert. Dorman. Rick's wanting at the feet. Now goes away. It's aimed at Sunderland. Comes down to Rick's. Oh, I say! Well, it seemed to take him half an hour to get it into a position. But when he struck, it was one to be remembered. And of course, still without Terry Butcher, suffering from this nose injury. O'Leary watching, and didn't get it right. But he's on the line to cover. As it turned out, it wasn't necessary. And again, he had to go too far wide. But David O'Leary made a mess of the back pass. And would speed off the line. Certainly helped save him from the error. Cork going through Davis. And here is Brazil. Here is Gates. And it took a deflection. George Wood, you're absolutely certain that his body was going to kill any spin. It's a second mistake in a matter of uh, half a minute by David O'Leary. Four in the middle. Rex, not the time for a cross like that. Put it away by Mills. And this is for Brazil. And Muren has made the run behind him. Wood committed. And Hollins covers the gap. Not the best thing I think we've probably seen from Ipswich. Brazil going inside. Muren making the loping run outside him. It was played right. Wood came to collect. The cross came in and Hollins was covering the hole. Away by Torbert, Brazil, George Burley, Davis, and by Davray. Ricks, and he's away. It's there now, surely. No, it's not. Goalkeeper's arm turned it away. Well, he was through it to the gap. It closed a little bit at the moment that he decided to shoot. He didn't get the venom that uh, he was probably hoping for. And the flattened arm of Civil turned it away for the corner. Davis takes. Good plant again. 
Sunderland. And a good header by Burley. Robson. And here, offside is Davis. So it wouldn't have mattered anyway. Probably feel relieved that he was offside. Enjoyed the first 45 minutes, and so has this 17-year-old, Stuart Robson, who scored the first goal of his senior career, which divides the teams at half-time. Well, the start of the second half of a match of great importance to both sides, being among the pack, chasing the leader, Southampton, both of them with games in hand. Here's White. <laughs> on by Sunderland. So the ball used to flick on for Frank Stapleton, who is sadly missed here. Players having to put up with the other side of freedom of contract. You can see a team being spoiled by the absence of a key player. Here's Sansom. Gorman. Looking for Sunderland. Stegel's neatly out of it. Just the one goal. Here's Sansom. Too well to find room for the shot. And the man of not dissimilar stature got down very quickly to cover his right hand post. Robson and a good catch. He met it with a fair amount of power. Took it well. Nice touch from Ricks. Davis is allowing an awful lot of cover to come back. Perhaps as determined as he should have been then. Davis once more. Only to Gorman. Not at him well there, the fullback. Had an opportunity then, but he didn't really seem to see it. Ricks! Another good start by Sybil. 
got hold of that on the turn, Graham Ricks. Goalkeeper on his six yard line was down smartly. White. Collins. seconds and we're in the last minute. Ricks. Robson. And the Ross and the crowd had nothing to do with this match. Sunderland. Gorman. And the last touch on the ball was made by the man who scored it. Stuart Robson's goal in the 11th minute, giving Arsenal the three points. And Ipswich must know that they had the chances to have changed the story, but seemed incapable of doing so. So the three points go to Arsenal, and the team get a pretty warm reception. So the final score, Arsenal 1, Ipswich Town 0, the scorer, Stuart Robson, and the verdict now from those Arsenal supporters. I think Arsenal played like a new team. I think if they persevere with their youngsters, they'll be in the top of London once again. I thought it was quite a good performance. Um, the defence played well, I thought. Midfield was reasonable, but again, it highlighted our lack of a striker. If we'd have had a striker in the first half, I think we could have sewn it up with two or three goals. I think that makes it uh, two defeats out of the last 17 games, and perhaps some of the press and media who have been having a go at the team should take notice of what Laurie McMenemy said this morning, which is that any team that writes Arsenal off for the champion, anybody who writes Arsenal off for the championship is very foolish indeed. I think it was a very fair game. I still say Arsenal need wingers and play football the way it should be played. I think the Arsenal midfield defence today was a bit lacking, but uh, on the, taking everything into account, it was a good result. Yes, I think they played extremely well, and I think with a bit of luck, they should have been three up in the first half. It's just the lack of strike power that we're short of. Well, whatever anybody says about their style, Arsenal continue to climb nearer the top, and their critics might be giving them just the edge they need to stay in the championship race, come what may. But I'd be more worried if I was Bobby Robson, because the numerous injuries to key Ipswich players uh, seem to have temporarily taken the sting out of them. Well, Arsenal's win has certainly boosted their chances of the championship, but for North London neighbours Spurs, today saw the end of their impossible dream of the Grand Slam. The League Cup final had begun perfectly for them when Steve Archibald scored in the 11th minute, but Liverpool, drawing on all the experience that has put them on top for a decade, gradually took a complete grip on the game. However, it wasn't until three minutes from the end of normal time, and a couple of minutes after Mark Lawrenson had cleared off the line from Steve Archibald, that Ronnie Whelan equalised. 
The Republic of Ireland youngster, who was my man of the match, then struck again in extra time before Ian Rush wrapped it up at 3-1 in the very last seconds. So what a remarkable collection of prizes for Bob Paisley. 16 in eight seasons since he took over from Bill Shankly as manager in July 1974. For the record, four league championships, three European Cups, two League Cups now, five Charity Shields, one UEFA Cup, and one European Super Cup. And don't forget the 62-year-old Paisley could still lead Liverpool to two more triumphs this season in the European Cup and in the league. Paisley was full of praise for young Ronnie Whelan, saying for a youngster to perform like that in his first Wembley game was quite outstanding. Whelan's reaction, I had no sleep at all last night thinking about Wembley. Spurs manager Keith Birkinshaw said, losing at Wembley is a real letdown after the big build-up. Liverpool always come back at you and I've never seen any other team close down Hoddle and Ardealis as well as Liverpool did. I'm sick of seeing Bob Paisley win things. I only hope I'm in the same position soon. Of course, both Liverpool and Spurs are still very much involved in the league championship and today's results will have done no harm at all to their prospects. The two leaders, Southampton and Swansea, were involved in goalless draws at home and, as you've seen, Ipswich lost at Highbury. Arsenal, in fact, moved up four places from eighth to fourth, where they're now only six points behind leaders Southampton with three games in hand. Manchester United didn't play, but Neighbours City drew one all at Nottingham Forest, with defender Tommy Caton marking his 100th league appearance by scoring. Paul Hooks of Notts County had a pretty unhappy day. He conceded a penalty, which Ray Stewart converted to give West Ham a 1-0 victory, and then in injury time, Hooks was sent off for a foul on Alan Devonshire. Champions Aston Villa warmed up for their European Cup second leg against Dynamo Kiev next Wednesday with a 3-1 win against Wolves. And former Villa manager Ron Saunders enjoyed his first win in charge of Birmingham, beating Stoke 2-1. Despite those three points, Birmingham stay in the bottom six ahead of Leeds on goal difference. Today, Leeds won at Sunderland with a goal by recent signing Frank Worthington, their first in seven games. Coventry drew at Swansea, while the bottom three all lost. In Division 2, Luton, who drew with Wrexham last night, are still five points clear of Watford, surprisingly beaten 4-2 at Norwich after being 2-1 ahead at half-time. Norwich manager Ken Brown's rather uncomplimentary comment, we were like fairies in the first half. So Blackburn and Sheffield Wednesday, who won today, made up three points on Watford, although they've both played two games more. Rotherham's great run of nine straight wins came to an end with a goalless draw against much-improved Newcastle. Pools and with 10 score draws, the dividend forecast is fair. Claim by Telegram for 24 points and the numbers 3, 14, 18, 20, 23, 25, 29, 35, 40 and 43. Finally, in Scotland, Celtic took another giant step towards retaining the Premier Division Championship when they went to St Mirren and convincingly defeated one of their main rivals for the title. Beckett once again behind it. McLeod. Good one, two, there's a brilliant goal! Superbly taken. 16 minutes of the first half gone, rejoicing amongst the Celtic supporters. That's McCluskey, tempting the man forward. Neatly inside, Burns has a lovely one too. Just overdone, and Thompson can't get down at it, swept away by Fulton, and Danny McGrain up again. Controls that well. Really, the pressure is on, and away. Tommy Burns, a great goal. should get that. Oh, Craney picked them off very well. He does these reverse passes uh, excellently, Craney. Going one way and then putting it to the man in the run. That's a gift to something. There's McCluskey inside. Oh, but it's Sullivan who puts it away before it reaches McCluskey. 3 nothing with uh, seven minutes of the first half remaining. Burns on the break. This is where Sully being good him back a little and then breaking very quickly a lot of good play that's an excellent ball Severin wide open McCluskey driving forward by do it himself 
He does. No wonder he turns to the crowd for the applause. The limelight right on him there. That's McDougal. First real touch of the ball. There he is again. Celtic right across the edge of the box. Making it difficult for Simon to see goal. They do that. That's a good ball, a great goal. That's retaliation by the substitute, Frank McDougall. McCluskey puts it to the side as uh, Craney came in. Simon wanting to make a game of it. Burns turns well, and this is where Sidburton have found it uh, difficult to pin Celtic down the turning of the front runners. That's good play, good understanding. A man in difficulties pushing it back, getting into the clear and getting on the return. Brilliant football by Celtic. Here's the cloud with a chance. He's got it good, yes. Beckett suddenly put it over the line, but I think I'll give the credit to Mother McLeod. Curling, and that must be, yes, the second by McDougall. And that now is 5-2, and I'm reaching for the pocket calculator. Well, that's all for tonight, except to note that not for the first time recently, a second division game on Match of the Day has been very much more exciting than a first division game. And to remind you that there's European Championship action from the worlds of boxing and football in Sports Night on Wednesday next. The programme starts at 9.30. Perhaps the feature of tonight's programme was the discipline and determination of Jackie Charlton's Sheffield Wednesday team. And in the middle of John Motson's interview with Big Jack, there was just a hint as to why the Sheffield Wednesday players nearly always obey orders. Good night to you. Look at them kids, are they stupid? Hey! What do you... Come on, give over. At your age. McCulloch! Hit the bar, Pearson! Oh, they've left Megson free. McCulloch at the post. Bannister. <laughs>